When we consider the special relevance of the Buddha's teaching to our own time, what I find especially important to note is that Buddhism can provide helpful insights and practices across a wide spectrum of disciplines from philosophy and psychology to medical care, ecology, even the running of a corporation, as our Meng here will be showing in his own book when it gets completed and published. So those who feel attracted to a particular aspect of Buddhist teaching don't have to buy the whole Buddhist show, so to speak, but they could take up whatever aspect attracts them and use it for their own purposes. The Buddha says, I don't have the closed fist of a teacher. So whatever is of benefit to somebody, they can take and use in their own lifetime, uh, as in applying it to their own life. Okay, one of the main ways in which Buddhism has been getting a foothold in the West, and one of its greatest promises for the unfolding of Western civilization has been through its systems of meditation. I also believe that this is one of the most important ways that Buddhism can help us to emerge from our own confusion and spiritual emptiness. As I said earlier, the dangers that we face, if we really investigate where they originate from, they don't originate from weapons, from industry, from corporate activities themselves, but they originate from our ways of engaging with the world. That is, they arise from greed, hatred, fear, and ignorance. And meditation is precisely the means that the Buddha has prescribed to help us face and overcome these mental afflictions. So in order to help the world to avert a destructive crisis, what we have to do is to strike a balance between external change and internal change. But without internal change, mere outer change, changes in governments, changes in politicians, changes in institutions, changes in economic policies, will be only superficial. For any outer change to be truly enduring, to truly strike at the root, it has to be accompanied by and driven by an inner change in people's hearts and minds. And the most effective way to bring about that change is through the practice of meditation. Sometimes people think that meditation is just a way of escaping from the problems of the world or just a way of relaxing the mind. But actually, meditation is the most immediate, most challenging, and most deeply personal way of contacting the real world. The heart and core of Buddhist meditation consists in what is called samasati, which is right mindfulness. The practice of mindfulness involves the methodical development of a simple mental faculty that is always available to us, but is seldom employed to its full advantage. Usually we use this faculty just in a superficial manner. The faculty is the faculty of awareness or attention. In our usual dealings with the world, the first moment of attention with which any experience begins is almost immediately overrun by associative thoughts and mental constructions, conceptual constructions. And so these conceptual constructions subordinate, subordinate our direct experience to our practical aims, and usually to our ego-centered motivations. The methodical practice of mindfulness aims at sustaining 
making continuous this initial moment of attention. So through repeated practice, the development of mindfulness transforms attention into a steady and continuous powerful beam of awareness that can be used to investigate the deep habits and patterns of thought and emotion and can even penetrate into the deep underlying currents of conscious experience itself. My own teacher, the German monk Venerable Jana Ponika Terra, wrote that the practice of right mindfulness is, quote, the master key for knowing the mind, the perfect tool for shaping the mind, and the manifestation of the mind that has been liberated. <laughs> 